Okay, so now what we're going to do is uh, we are going to define trig functions um, of angles, kind of like what we did in chapter 5 with the unit circle. But now we're going to say, look, we don't necessarily need a unit circle. Okay, so just a comment on that. What we're going to do now is we will use the same idea We're going to use the same idea to define trigonometric uh, functions as section 6-1, right? So if you remember in 6-1, we defined trig functions as uh, like sine is opposite over hypotenuse and so forth, okay? However, the one main difference in this section is that we will have angles of any measure to work with. So if you think about it, um, last section or in section um, two actually, not six, six one, in section two, the angles we dealt with were all um, acute angles, right? We didn't have any angles that were obtuse, right? So um, now we're basically saying we'll have any type of angle. Um, so when we'll have any type of angle to work with, which will require us, which will require us to take a slightly different approach okay so that's kind of uh, and, and you'll see kind of what we're doing so let's start off with defining trig functions so the definition of a trigonometric functions and before I actually give you each trig function as to how they're defined I'll first describe it and then we'll draw a picture and using the picture we'll see exactly how kind of uh, this stuff relates to section two okay so we're gonna say let theta be an angle in standard position and I'm gonna underline this because what you should notice is that um, there's going to be a lot of pictures that we're going to draw in this class. And whenever we draw angles, I always draw them in a standard position, especially when we're working with these trick functions that the angle could be any type of an angle, right? It doesn't have to be an acute angle. So, and what we're going to say is, we're going to say, and let P, which is defined as the point X comma Y, be a point on the terminal side. Okay. So if R equals to so if R equals to um, a square root of x squared plus y squared Okay, so sorry about that, I had a... Okay, so if r equals to the square root of x squared plus y squared, this is defined as the distance from the origin to the point p of x comma y, then so before we actually define these, um, define the trig functions, let's uh, first 
draw a picture that kind of works with this here. So if I'm drawing a picture, um, and the word sank theta could be any angle. So I'm going to take theta to be, and it's going to be in standard position. I'm going to draw, I don't know, let's pretend theta lands in quadrant two. Okay. So then what are we saying here? Point, uh, P is a point on the terminal side. So um, obviously if this is my angle theta, this is going to be my terminal side. And we've drawn um, angles in standard position in the past. So this is the point P, which has coordinates X comma Y um, on our terminal side. And let's now take a look at R. So why is R defined as square root of X squared plus Y squared? So if I draw my right triangle here, see if I, if I pick the terminal point or, or the point on the terminal side and draw it straight to the x-axis. And remember, these right triangles that we're drawing, we always draw to the x-axis. What do we notice? Um, this distance, well, this distance is x, right? Because how do I get to this point? I start from the origin and I travel x units to the left. And then what's this length? This length is y. And this length that we're deciding, uh, calling r, that's what the distance from the origin to that point. And hopefully you see how we got the answer to know r to be square root of x squared plus y squared. It's because we have a right triangle and we're using the Pythagorean theorem. And so here's r. So if you look at this, this is my x, y, and r. Okay, now look, here's theta. So this is the angle theta, which then, what's sine of theta defined as? So sine of theta is defined as um, y over r. Okay, so if you think about it, wherever this angle puts me, and here's where um, <clears throat> this is similar to what we did last section because this angle puts me here, and my reference angle is where I'm going to focus on, and what is this basically sine defined as? Opposite over hypotenuse, which is where the y over r comes from. And Comparing this to chapter 5, if you remember, what do we say sine of theta was in chapter 5? We said it was just y. Now, it's not really just y. It was y over r. But if you remember, r is the radius of our circle. And in chapter 5, what kind of a circle did we use? We used a unit circle, which means r was 1. So y over 1 is just y. So that's why we wrote y over r, or y just y, because r was always 1. Now we're saying, look, R doesn't necessarily have to be always 1. But for the case of the unit circle, if this was a unit circle, then sine of theta would just be y instead of y over r. Okay? And then, so then if we think about that, cosine of theta, if you remember in chapter 5, we said it was just x. Now it's going to be what? x over r because it's adjacent over hypotenuse. Okay? And then we have tangent of theta, which is what? Opposite over adjacent, which is y over x, and then obviously we have our reciprocals. So cosecant of theta, which is the reciprocal of sine, will be r over y. <clears throat> Secant of theta, which is the reciprocal of cosine, will be r over x. And then cotangent of theta, which is the reciprocal of tangent, will be x over y. So these are our trig functions. Make sure to know them. I mean, I know you've seen this before, um, especially the tangent. Notice how it's the y over x, x over y. Um, it's just the R is popping up now because we don't have a unit circle. N we don't necessarily have a unit circle. If it was a unit circle, then you should notice that this is exactly the same thing as what we defined in Chapter 5. So technically speaking, I'm not telling you that, hey, what you're learning now is different than what you learned in Chapter 5. It is the same thing, except in Chapter 5, R was always 1. Now we're saying R could be anything. Okay, so um, one comment I want to make here is that uh, note x and y can take on positive and negative values, but r is always positive. Okay, now why can x and y take on positive and negative values? It all depends on which quadrant you land in. Like see this angle put this point in quadrant 2, where in quadrant 2 x is negative and y is positive. 
But why is R always positive? Um, because R is described as a distance, right? In fact, it's the radius of that circle that I'm traveling around. So R can never be negative. X and Y can be positive or negative depending on which quadrant you land in, right? In quadrant 1, X and Y are both positive. Quadrant 2, X is negative, Y is positive. Quadrant 3, both X and Y are negative. Quadrant 4, uh, Y is negative, X is positive, okay? So <clears throat> what we're going to do now is now we're going to focus on um, solving or finding these trig ratios without using the table. If you remember, I've constantly uh, told you guys in the past that, hey, for now, we will, I will give you a table, but there will be a point where we're not going to need a table. And now you're going to see how we're going to work around this, okay? So um, what we're going to do, focus on now is that uh, we will now be given specific angles and will be asked to find the ratio of a trigonometric functions. Okay, so to do so, uh, I'm going to write out some steps. So we're going to say to do so, uh, we will follow these steps. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do, and this is kind of like my go-to, that's the first thing I always do, is draw the angle that's been given to us, draw the angle in standard position. Notice how standard position is key. You have to draw it in standard position. Okay. The second thing is, which we've talked about this in chapter five, and I'll kind of talk about it again slightly. We're going to identify its reference number. And some books, instead of reference number, they call it reference angle, right? I mean, so reference angle, reference number, same thing, right? If you remember, the reference number was what we would draw from the terminal side. It's an acute angle to the x-axis, okay? So you identify the reference angle or the reference number. And then what you're going to do is you're going to then pick... And here's the beauty of this part. And this is what I love about trigonometry. We're going to say pick any point on the terminal side and create a right triangle. And the right triangle is going to be to the x-axis. Okay, so remember, we always draw right triangles to the x-axis, okay? Now, one other comment I want to make. We don't, we, there, there may be times where we can't draw a right triangle. And the only times we won't be able to draw a right triangle is if our angle is a quadrantal. So if um, it's a quadrantal angle, and if you remember, a quadrantal angle is an angle that ends up on the x or the y axis. Um, we won't be able to create, we won't be able to create a right triangle. But the good news is we don't need one anyway, but it isn't. Uh, need it anyway. Okay, so the good news is, the reason why it's not needed is because we could identify the X, Y, and R right away. Okay, so um, the reason why we're drawing these right triangles is to identify our X, Y, and R. So if we have quadrantals, then the X, Y, and R's can be easily found. Okay, so um, that's kind of, uh, so then let's continue on. So then um, in step four, obviously if uh, we have a quadrantal, then you would bypass step four and go to the next step. But um, 
in step four. Now, steps four and five, we're assuming that, hey, we were able to create a right triangle. Um, and what's going to happen is then in step four, you're going to choose any side of the triangle and pick it to have any number of your choice. So here's another nice convenience factor of this, right? You, you're going to have your right triangle, you're going to pick any side, and you can choose that number to be whatever you want it to be, okay? So you can call it one or whatever. The only thing you need to make sure of is that you assign a, the appropriate positive and negative values. So like, for example, if the X needs to be negative, you can't make it positive, right? If the Y needs to be negative, you can't make it positive, okay? But as far as the numerical value goes, you can choose any number of your choice, just for one of the sides, okay? Not, not all of the sides, okay? Uh, and I'll explain to you guys why in a minute, and when we do an example, you'll see it. So any number of your choice. Um, the only thing you need to make sure uh, to, to, to take into account is that just be sure to know when the numbers should be negative, when the numbers should be negative or positive. Okay, because see for the x-axis when I move to the left, for the my x is going to be negative. When I move to the right, x will be positive. When I move up, y will be positive. When I move down, y will be negative. And remember, r is always positive. Okay, now here's the, here's the kind of beauty of this. Now, in step five, what you're going to notice is when you pick a missing side or you pick a side and you make it whatever you want, the right triangle you've created is either going to be a 30, 60, 90 or a 45, 45, 90, which means if you have one of the sides, then you could find the other two sides without any problems. Okay, so um, then we're going to say, look, determine the other missing sides by using 30, 60, 90 or 45, 45, 90 triangles. Okay. Now, one thing that you might be wondering, so we're going to have 30, 60, 90, 45, 45, 90. You might be wondering, hey, how is it that I could choose any side of a triangle and give it to, uh, assign it any number? Like, what if I pick a different number than you do? Um, what are ratios, or once we give the answer, because see, once you uh, fill out the missing sides of the 30, 60, 90, and 45, 45, 90, right? Once you pick that one side, then using the blueprints that we talked about in section two, you could find the other two missing sides of the 30, 60, 90, and 45, 45, 90. Then you would basically, once you do that, then you would state the ratios, right? Which, what were the ratios? If you remember, sine is y over r, cosine is x over r, and so on. So you might be wondering, how come I could choose any side um, and make it any value of my choice. It's just because when we use these ratios, the different triangles that we have, um, our triangles might be different, but the beauty of this is our triangles will be similar, which what does that mean? The ratios will be equal, right? And then obviously trig functions are just a bunch of ratios, right? They're just a bunch of fractions. So that will basically finish this off, okay? so. Now let's look at a couple of examples and then that will wrap up this uh, first part of this section. Um, you will get separate notes for the second part of section three, but let's talk about the reference angles. So first find, let's find reference angles. So find the reference angles for A, and remember reference angle or reference number is the same thing, 13 pi over seven. Okay. Now. And then for part B, theta is 600. Okay, now when angles are in radian measure, um, which we've worked with these before, to me, 
Working with radian measure and identifying reference numbers, those are easier than anything else because, see, as long as the 13 over 7 is completely simplified, which it is, my answer as far as my reference number goes is, pi, is basically just the pi over whatever the fraction is. So the reference number for this is pi over 7. Okay. Now, I know we've talked about this in the past also. Um, some... A, a, a couple of comments to make like see I personally prefer to work with radian measure because with radian measure I could spot my reference angle in advance okay so um, here's a shortcut kind of like a trick that I think about here's kind of like a shortcut when we're working in radian measure if I have a number pi over 3 okay and remember this can't be simplified any further right like it can't be 6 pi over 3 because 6 pi over 3 simplifies to 2 pi. But if it's like, let's say, 2 pi over 3 and so on. This means my reference number is, reference angle is pi over 3. So this has a reference angle of pi over 3 and in degrees, or we would say 60 degree reference angle. Which notice how we kind of like that. Um, if I have a number pi over 4, this has a reference angle of pi over 4 or in degrees that's the same thing as 45 degrees okay and remember these have to be completely simplified if I have a number pi over 6 this has a reference angle of pi over 6 or 30 degrees okay now we like the 30 45 60s how come because those are su suggesting we're going to get 30 60 90 45 45 90 triangles okay and then if I have a number pi over 2 or just a number pi these are quadrantals okay so for a radian measure you could easily spot your reference number um, but for something like this where this is in degrees the way we do part B is slightly different we draw the angle out so 600 degrees and always has to be in uh, what do you call it in the standard position so if I'm drawing 600 degrees this is what 360 and if I go another circle 720 is too much right so this one complete circle is 360 then that becomes 450 540 and then 600 puts me here so if you remember before when I I went 360 450 540 now how much more did I need to go to get to 600 it was 60 more so my reference angle here that reference number is 60 degrees okay so remember the reference number always is the angle from the terminal side of where you end up to the x-axis okay now another way that we could have done this which we've already talked about this you could have said look why don't I subtract 360 until 600 is between 0 and 360? So if I did that, what would 600 minus 360 be? That would equal to 240. And then you'd say, hey, I could draw this because it'll be the same thing as 600 because all I did was subtract 360. So this might be more convenient for you. If you said 240, where would that put you? That would put you here, right? So how would I find this reference number? You'd say 240 minus the half a circle which would be 180 right so you'd say this would be 240 minus 180 which is 60 degrees so that reference angle is 60 degrees so notice how they both give us the same reference angle okay now since we've had some practice with the reference angle let's actually get to the main idea of this section so this will be our last example but this is pretty much the important part right this is very important we're saying find cosine of 60 degrees Part B will be tangent of 240 degrees, C will be sine of 120 degrees, and D will be sine of 43 pi over 6. Okay, so let's kind of go through our steps. If you remember uh, when we were given C, we we're asked to find what? Cosine of 60 degrees. So we're no longer using the table, but to me, to be honest with you, drawing a picture is the most important part. So the first thing we're going to do is what? Draw this angle in standard position. Okay, so we draw the angle, which is 60, and we identify the reference angle. So since it's in quadrant 1, it is itself. So that's 60 degrees. 
So then what is it that I said we do? We pick a point, any point on the terminal side, we make a right triangle. Now notice what kind of a triangle I've created. A 30, 60, 90. Okay? So now that we have a 30, 60, 90, then what did I say? We pick any side of our liking and we give it any value we want. So if you remember for a 30, 60, 90, we like to find work with the side that's opposite the 30 degrees, which is the shortest side. So I'm going to pick this side. I'm going to call it 1. Now, you can call it whatever you want, but since it's moving to the right, I know it's positive 1. Now, if you remember from last section, if this is 1, then we could find a longer leg, because what do I do? To get from here to there, I multiply by rad 3, so this would be just rad 3. And then how do I get from the shorter leg to the hypotenuse? I multiply it by 2, which is 2. And since I'm in quadrant 1, all my x, y, and r are positive. So once you found this, once we found all the missing sides, now I could use the fact for cosine of 60 was what? We defined it as x over r, which is 1 half. So notice how we found this value without using the table, whereas last chapter I was giving you the table and you're finding cosine of 60 degrees to be 1 half. But here you see that we don't need it. Okay? So you might want to pause the video and try to do B and C on your own and then press play. But moving on to part B, what's the first thing I want to do? I want to draw this angle 240 degrees, which would put me where? 180, 240. Okay? That's 240 degrees. And what do I know? My reference angle here is 60 degrees. 60 degree reference angle. So once again, if I pick any point and draw my right triangle to the x-axis, so that's 60, this is 30. So once again, we have a 30, 60, 90 triangle. So once again, I'm going to pick a side, call it any value I want. So I'm going to go opposite to the 30, but since I'm moving to the left, I'm going to call this 1, but it's going to be negative since I'm moving to the left. Okay? And then um, what would this be? To get from here to here to the longer leg, I'd multiply by rad 3. So this would be rad 3, except since I'm moving down, it'll be negative rad 3. So notice how the sign, I'm deciding on, hey, is it positive or negative after I find the value? So then what do I do? To go from the shorter leg to the hypotenuse, I double it, it becomes 2, and if you remember the radius, r is always positive, so it could never be negative. So tangent of 240, by definition, is what? It's y over x. So it's negative rad 3 over negative 1, which becomes rad 3. Okay? So let's talk about sine of 120 now. So sine of 120. So we're doing the same thing. Draw the picture um, in standard position. So here's 120. Now to find the reference angle here, that becomes what? That becomes, uh, it's 60 degrees again. Okay, and then if I pick a point to draw my right triangle, that becomes 30. So it's a 30, 60, 90 triangle here. So these all happen to be 30, 60, 90, which is fine. We haven't any, had any 45, 45, 90, but I, I'm just kind of working with each angle separately, right? So then what do I do? Once again, I pick any side. So we like to work with the side opposite to the 30 degrees. So I'll call this 1, but since I'm moving to the left, it'll be negative 1. Now, to get from the shorter leg to the longer leg, we multiply 1 by rad 3, and it's rad 3. And since I'm moving up, it'll be positive rad 3. So notice how the rad 3 isn't going to be negative. And then to get from the shorter leg to the hypotenuse, that's just going to be you multiply the 1 by 2. And remember, it can't be negative. So sine by definition is what? It's y over r. So sine of 120 degrees is equal to rad 3 over 2. And also hopefully you guys realize how important the angle is, right? Because whenever you say rad 3 over 2 and you say, you don't never do this, and I've seen people do this in the past, you sine is rad 3 over 2. This makes no sense because I'll say, wait a minute, sine of what angle, right? So you always have to include the angle with your trig function, okay? So just keep that in mind, okay? So moving on to this last one, which this is in radian measure. Um, and what we can do is we can take 43 pi over 6 
and we could, since this is much larger than 2 pi, I could keep subtracting 2 pi just so it'll give me a better idea. And by the way, we can use this trick that I showed you earlier. Since it's pi over 6, we know our reference angle is going to be 30 degrees. I just want to know which quadrant this lands in, right? So I know that this is going to give me a 30, 60, 90 triangle over the end. But if I subtract 2 pi, what would be 43 pi over 6 minus 2 pi? That would be 31 pi over 6, which subtract 2 pi again, which would be what then? It'll be um, 12, 19 pi over 6, and then subtract another 2 pi, which then gives us what? 7 pi over 6. Okay, very good. So now I can draw this angle and say, look, sine of 43 pi over 6, that's going to be the same thing as what? sine of 7 pi over 6. They're going to be equivalent because I'm just subtracting 2 pi, which puts them in the same place. So 7 pi over 6, if you notice, is a little bigger than pi, so that's going to land in this quadrant. And to be exact, we know since this is pi over 6, we know the reference angle is going to be 30 degrees as I gave you earlier. So if I draw my right triangle, I get a 30 60 90 so once again since it's a 30 60 90 again I, i'll start with the side opposite the shortest uh, angle or the smallest angle opposite 30 which is this guy so i'll call this one but since it's moving down it'll be negative one now to get to the longer leg i have to multiply by rad three so one times rad three is rad three but since i'm moving to the left will be negative rad three and then one times two is two and remember r is always positive so sine of 7 pi over 6, or same thing as 43 pi over 6, it doesn't matter. They're, they both end up in the same place. So sine of 43 pi over 6 is what? It's y over r, so it's negative 1 half. Okay, so there's your answer for that as well. Okay, so that's what I want to talk about today. Um, we will still continue on with section 3, but I want to cover the first half. Um, please make sure to ask me questions if you have any, because this is very, very important. Um, if you're having any difficulty with this stuff, then make sure to talk to me, because we are going to kind of use this over and over and over. Okay, so please don't hesitate to ask me any questions if you do have any.